Section three, chapter two of Diana Tempest by Mary Chumley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Volume three, chapter two. A funeral morn is lit in heaven's hollow, and pale the starlights follow. Christina Rossetti. Towards nine o'clock in the evening, carriage after carriage began to drive up to Overley in the moonlight. When Di came down, the white stone hall and the music-room were already crowded with guests, among whom she recognised Lord Hemsworth, Mr. Lumley, and Miss Crupps, who had been staying at houses in the neighbourhood for the hunt-ball the night before, and had come on with their respective parties, to the not unmixed gratification of John. "'Here we are again,' said Mr. Lumley, flying up to her. "'No favouritism, I beg, Miss Tempest. Tempest shall carry one skate, and I will take the other. Hemsworth must make himself happy with the button-hook. "'Great heavens, Tempest, whose funeral have you been ordering?' For at that moment the alarm-bell of the castle began to toll. "'It is unnecessary to hide in the curtain,' said John. "'That bell is only rung in case of fire. It's the signal for lighting up.' And, headed by a band of torches, the whole party went streaming out of the wide archway, a gay crowd of laughing, expectant people, into the gardens where vari-coloured lines of lights gleamed terrace below terrace along the stone balustrades, and Neptune reigned in his dolphins in the middle of his fountain in a shower of golden spray. The path down to the lake through the wood was lit by strings of Chinese lanterns in the branches. The little bridge over the frozen brook was outlined with miniature rose-coloured lights, in which the miracles wrought by the hoar-frost on each transfigured reed and twig glowed flame-colour to their inmost tracery against the darkness of the overhanging trees. Di walked with John in Fairyland. "'Beauty and the Beast,' said someone, probably Mr. Lumley. But only the Beast heard, and he did not care. There was a chorus of exclamations as they all emerged from the wood into the open. The moon was shining in a clear sky, but its light was lost in the glare of the bonfires, leaving red and blue and intensest green on the further bank of the lake round which a vast crowd was already assembled. The islands shone, complete circles of coloured light like jewels in a silver shield. The whole lake of glass blazed. The bonfires flung great staggering shadows across the hanging woods. John and I looked back. High overhead, Overly hung in mid-air in a thin veil of mist, a castle built in light. Every window and archer's loophole, from battlement to basement, the long lines of mullioned lattice of the pit gallery and the garret gallery above, throbbed with light. The dining hall gleamed through its double glass. The rose window of the chapel was a rose of fire. "'They've forgotten my window,' said John. And I saw that the lowest portion of the western tower was dark. Her own oriel window and arches next to it shone bravely. Mitty was watching from the nursery window. In the fierce, wavering light she could see John, conspicuous in his Russian coat and peaked Russian cap, advance across the ice, escorted by torches, to the ever-increasing multitude upon the further bank. The enthusiastic cheering of the crowd when it caught sight of him came up to her, as she sat with a cheek pressed against the lattice, and she wept for joy. Di's heart quickened as she heard it, her pride, which had first steeled her against John, had deserted to his side. It centred in him now. She was proud of him. Lord Hemsworth, on his knee before her, fastening her skates, asked her some question relating to a strap, and looking up as she did not answer, marvelled at the splendid colour in her cheek and the flash in her eyes looking beyond him over his head. At a signal from John the band began to play, and some few among the crowd to dance on the sanded portion of the ice set apart for them. But far the greater number gathered in dense masses to watch the musical ride on skates which the house-party at Overly had been practising the previous day, which John led with Lady Alice, circling in and out round groups of torches, and ending with a grand chain, in which Mr. Lumley and Miss Crupps collapsed together, to the delight of the spectators and of Mr. Lumley himself, who said he should tell his mamma and still the crowd increased. As John was watching the hockey-players contorted like prawns, wheeling fast and furious between their flaming goals, which dripped liquid fire onto the ice, the local policeman came up to him. 
"'There's over two thousand people here tonight, sir,' he said. "'The more the better,' said John. "'Sure, and I've been about among em, me and Jones. "'And there's a sight of people here, sir, as are no tenants of yours, "'and roguish characters, some of them.' "'Sure to be,' said John. "'If there's any horseplay, treat it short and sharp. "'I'll back you up. "'Have a dozen men down here from the house to help to keep order, "'but there'll be no need. "'Trust Yorkshiremen to keep amused and in a good temper.' And in truth the great concourse of John's guests was enjoying itself to the utmost, dancing, sliding, clutching, falling one on the top of the other, with perfect good humour, shouting with laughter, men, women, and children all together. As the night advanced, an ox was roasted whole on the ice, and a cauldron of beer was boiled. There was a tent on the bank in which a colossal supper had been prepared for all. Behind it great brick fireplaces had been built, round which the people sat in hundreds, drinking, singing, eating beer and soup. They were tactful, these rough Yorkshiremen. Not one came across to the farther bank set apart for t quality, where another supper, not half so decorously conducted, was in full swing by the boathouse. John skated down there after presiding at the tent. Perhaps negus and mutton broth were never handed about under such dangerous circumstances. The best consommé à la royale watered the earth. The men tottered on their skates over the frozen ground, bearing soup to the coveys of girls sitting on the banks in nests of fur rugs. Mr. Lumley and Miss Crupps had supper together in one of the boats. Mr. Lumley continually vociferating, Not at home, when called upon, and retaliating with Genoese pastry, until he was dislodged with oars. He emerged, wielding the drumstick for chicken, and a free fight ensued between him and little Mr. Dornay, armed with a soup-ladle, which ended in Mr. Lumley's being forced onto his knees among the mince-pies, and disarmed. John looked round for Di, but she was in the centre of a group of girls, and he felt aggrieved that she had not kept a vacancy for him beside her, which of course she could easily have done. Presently, when the fireworks began, every one made a move towards the lower part of the lake in twos and threes, and then, his opportunity came. He held out his hand to help her to her feet, and they skated down the ice together. Everyone was skating hand in hand, but surely no two hands trembled one in the other as theirs did. The evening was growing late. A low mist was creeping vague and billowy across the land, making the tops of the trees look like islands in a ghostly sea. The bonfires, burning down red and redder into throbbing hearts of fire, gleamed blurred and weird. The rockets rushed into the air and dropped in coloured flame, flushing the haze. The moon peered in and out. And to John and I it seemed as if they too were sweeping on winged feet among a thousand phantasmagoria, in the midst of which they were the only realities. In other words, they were in love. "'Come down to the other end of the lake, and let us look at the fireworks from there,' said John. And they wheeled away from the crowd and the music and the noise, past all the people and the lighted islands and the boathouse, and the swinging lamps along the banks, away to the deserted end of the lake. A great stillness seemed to have retreated there, under shadow of the overhanging trees. The little island left in darkness for the waterfowl, with its laurels bending frozen into the ice, had no part or lot in the distant jargon of sound, and the medley of rising, falling, skimming lights. There was no sound, save the ringing of their skates, and a little crackling of the ice among the grass at the edge. They skated round the island, and then slackened and stood still to look at the scene in the distance. One of the bonfires just replenished leapt one instant lurid high, only to fall the next in a whirlwind of sparks and cover the lake with a rush of smoke. Figures dashed in and out, one moment in the full glare of light, the next flying like shadow through the smoke. "'It is like a dream,' said I. "'If it is one, I hope I shan't wake up just yet.' To John it was not so wild and incredible a dream as that her hand was still in his. She had not withdrawn it. No, his senses did not deceive him. He looked at it, gloved in his bare one. He held it still. He could not wait another moment. He must have it to keep always. Surely, surely fate had not thrown them together for nothing beneath this veiled moon among the silver trees. Die, 
he said below his breath. "'There's someone on the bank watching us,' said Di suddenly. John turned, and in the uncertain light saw a man's figure come deliberately out of the shadow of the trees to the bank above the ice. John gave a sharp exclamation. "'What has he got in his hand?' said Di. He did not answer. He dropped her hand and moved suddenly away from her. The figure slowly raised one arm. There was a click and a snap. Missed far, said John, making a rush for the edge, but he turned immediately. He remembered his skates. Di screamed piercingly. In the distance came the crackling of fireworks and the murmur of the delighted crowd. Would no one hear? The figure on the bank did not stir. Only a little steel edge of light rose slowly again. There was a sharp report, a momentary puff of light in smoke, and John staggered and began scratching and scraping the ice with his skates. Di raised shrieks that shook the stars and rushed towards him and the cruel moon came creeping out, making all things visible. "'Go back!' he gasped hoarsely. "'Keep away from me! He will fire again!' And he did so, for as she rushed up to John, and in spite of the strength with which he pushed her from him, caught him in her arms and held him tightly to her, there was a second report, and the muff hopped and ripped in her hand. She screamed again. Surely someone would come! She could hear the ringing of skates and voices. Torches were wheeling towards her. Lanterns were running along the edge. Good God, how slow they were! "'Go back! Go back!' gasped John, and his head fell forward on her breast. He seemed slipping out of her arms, but she upheld him, clasped convulsively to her with a strength of despair. "'Where?' shouted voices, halfway up the lake. She tried to shriek again, but only a harsh, guttural sound escaped her lips. The man had not gone away. She had her back to him, but she heard him run a few steps along the frost-bitten bank, and she knew it was to make his work sure. John became a dead weight upon her. She struggled fiercely with him, but he dragged her heavily to her knees and fell from her grasp, exposing himself to full view. There was a click. With a wild cry she flung herself down upon his body, covering him with her own, her face pressed against him. "'We will die together! We will die together!' she gasped. She heard a low curse from the bank, and suddenly there was a turmoil of voices and a rushing and flaring of lights all round her, and then a sharp cry like the fire engines clearing the London streets. "'I must get him to the side,' she said to herself, and she beat her hands feebly on the ice. Away in the distance in some other world the band strung up. He's a fine old English gentleman. Her hands touched something wet and warm. "'The thaw has come at last,' she thought and consciousness and feeling ebbed away together. End of Volume 3, Chapter 2 Volume 3, Chapter 3 of Diana Tempest by Mary Chumley This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers Volume 3, Chapter 3 And Dawn, sore trembling still, and grey with fear, looked hardly forth, a face of heavier cheer than one which grief or dread yet half enshrouds. Swinburne When Dyke came to herself it was to find that she was sitting on the bank supported by Miss Crupp's trembling arm, with her head on Miss Crupp's shoulder. Someone bending over her, could it be Lord Hemsworth with that blanched face and bare head, was wiping her face with the gentleness of a woman. "'Have I had a fall?' she asked dizzily. I don't remember. I thought it was Miss Crupps who fell. Yes, you've had a fall, said Lord Hemsworth hurriedly. But you'll be all right directly. Don't be all night with that brandy, Lumley. Di suddenly perceived Mr. Lumley close at hand, trying to jerk something out of a little silver lamp into a tumbler. She'd seen that lamp before. It had been handed round with lighted brandy in it with the mince pies. No one drank it by itself. Evidently there was something wrong. I, I don't understand, she said beginning to look about her. A confused gleam of remembrance was dawning in her eyes, which terrified Lord Hemsworth. Oh, drink this, he said quickly, pressing the tumbler against her lip. Her teeth chattered against the rim. Miss Crupps was weeping silently. Di pushed away the glass and stared wildly about her. What was this great crowd of eyes kept back by a chain of men? What was that man in a red uniform with a trumpet craning forward to see? There was a sound of women crying. How dark it was! Where was the moon gone to? "'What is it?' she whispered hoarsely, stretching out her hands to Lord Hemsworth, and looking at him with an agony of appeal. 
What has happened? But he only took her hands and held them hard in his. If he could have died to spare her that next moment, he would have done it. When I say three, said a distinct voice near at hand, gently, men, one, two, three, that's it. Di turned sharply in the direction of the voice. There was a knot of people on the ice at a little distance. One was kneeling down. Another knelt, too, holding a lantern ringed with mist. As she looked, the others raised something between them in a fur rug, something heavy, and began to move slowly to the bank. Her face took a rigid look. She remembered. She rose suddenly to her feet with a voiceless cry, and would have fallen forward on her face had not Lord Hemsworth caught her in his arms. He held her closely to him, and put his shaking, blood-stained hand over her eyes. Miss Crupps sobbed aloud. Mr. Lumley sat down by her, telling her not to cry, and assuring that it would all be all right. But when he was not comic, he was not up to much. There was no need to keep the crowd off any longer. Their whole interest centred in John, and they broke away in murmuring masses along the bank and down the ice in the wake of the little band with the lantern. Now that the lantern had gone, the place was wrapped in a white darkness. The other lights had apparently gone out, except the red end of a torch on the bank. The mist was covering the valley. "'Is he dead? Is he dead?' gasped Di, clinging convulsively to the friend who had loved her so long and so faithfully. "'No, Di, no,' said Lord Hemsworth, speaking as if to a child. "'Not dead, only hurt. And the doctor is here. He was on the ice when it happened.' He was with you both almost as soon as I was. I am going to take off your skates. Can you walk a little with my help? Yes. It would be better to be going gently home. Put your hands in your muff. Here it is. You must put in the other hand as well. The bank is deep here. Lean on me. And Lord Hemsworth helped her up the bank and guided her stumbling feet towards the dwindling constellation of lights at the further end of the lake. A party of men passed them in the drifting mist. One of them turned back. It was Archie, his face streaming with perspiration. "'Did you get him?' asked Lord Hemsworth. "'Get him? Not a chance,' said Archie. He stood on the bank till Dawn and I were within ten yards of him, and then laughed and ran quietly away. He knew we could not follow on our skates, though he made a rush for him. By the time we got him off he was out of sight, of course. I expect he's doubled back and is watching among the crowd now.' "'Will you know him again?' "'No, he was masked. He, he would never have let me come so close to him if he had not been. I say, how is John?' Lord Hemsworth glared at Archie, but the latter was of the species that never takes a hint, like his father before him, who was always deeply affronted if people resented his want of tact. He called it touchiness on their part. The touchiness of the world in general affords tactless persons a perennial source of offended astonishment. "'What are you frowning at me about?' said Archie, in an injured voice. "'What has become of John? Hello, what's that? Why, it's the omnibus. They've been uncommonly quick about getting it down. My word, the horses are giving trouble. They can't get them past the bonfires.' "'Go and say Mrs. Tempest and Miss Crupps are coming,' said Lord Hemsworth, "'and keep places for them.' He knew the omnibus had not been sent for them, but he did not want Di to realise for whom it was required. Archie hurried on. Miss Crupps and Mr. Lumley passed at a little distance. "'You are deceiving me,' gasped I. You, "'You mean it kindly, but you are deceiving me. He's dead. Did not Archie say he was dead? It's no good keeping it from me.' Lord Hemsworth tried to soothe her in vain. "'On the bank shot twice,' she went on incoherently. "'I, I tried to get between, but it was no good, and I, I screamed. But you were all so long in coming. I never knew people so slow. You were too late, too late, too late.' Lord Hemsworth was experiencing that unbearable wrench at the heart which goes by the easy name of emotion. He was reading his death warrant in every random word Di said. It appeared to him that he had always known that John loved Di, and yet until this evening he had never thought of it, and certainly never dreamed for a moment that she cared for him. He had not imagined that Di could care for anyone. The ease with which any man can marry any woman nowadays— the readiness of women to give their affection to any one, irrespective of age, character, and antecedents, has awakened in men's minds a profound and too well-grounded disbelief in women's love. The average woman of the present day is, as men are well aware, in love with marriage, 
and in order to attain that to that state a preference for one person rather than another is quickly seen to be prejudicial. For though love conduces to happy marriages, love conduces also to the catastrophe of single life, and is but a blind leader of the blind at best. Lord Hemsworth loved Di, but that was different. The fact that she, being human, might be equally attached to himself or to some other man had never struck him. It struck him now, and for a few minutes he was speechless. It was only a very great compassion and tenderness that was able to wrestle with and vanquish the intolerable pain of the moment. "'See, I," he said gently through his white lips, "'look at that great tear and hole through your muff. I, I saw it directly I picked it up. A bullet did that, do you understand? A bullet that perhaps would have hit Tempest but for you. But you saved him from it. Perhaps he's better now and afraid you are hurt. There's the carriage coming to us. Let us go on to meet it. And in truth the great overly omnibus, with men at the horses' heads, was lurching across the uneven turf to meet them. "'Where is John?' asked I of Archie, peering at the empty carriage. "'The doctor would not have him lifted in, after all,' said Archie. "'They went on, on foot. We may as well go up in it.' And he helped in Lady Alice Fane and Miss Crupps, who came up at the moment. Lord Hemsworth followed Di and sat down by her. He was determined she should be spared all questioning. Mr. Lumley and Mr. Dorney got in too, and sat silently staring straight in front of them. No one spoke. Archie stood on the step, and the long, lumbering vehicle turned and got slowly under way, the same in which such a merry party had driven to the ball the night before. As they reached the courtyard, a confused mass of people became visible within it, the guests of the evening, the girls standing about in silent groups, muffled to the eyes, for the cold had become intense, the men hurrying to and fro, getting out their own horses and helping the coachman to harness them. Through the darkness came the uplifted voices of Lindo and Fritz in hysterics of being debarred from taking part in the festivities. Carriages were beginning to drive off. There was no leave-taking. "'There's our omnibus,' said Mr. Lumley to Miss Crubbs. "'That's Montague lighting the lamps. They would be looking for us.' And they got out and rejoined their party, nodding silently to the others who drove on to the hall door, Lord Hemsworth with them. He seemed quite oblivious of the fact that he was not staying at Overley. The hall was brilliantly lighted. Every carved lion and griffin on the grand staircase held its lamp. The house-party was standing about in the hall. They looked at the remainder as they came in, but no one spoke. Miss Fane was blinking in their midst. The other elder ladies who had stayed up at the castle whispered with their daughters. A blaze of light and silver came through the opened folding doors of the dining-hall, where supper for a large number had been prepared. "'Any news?' asked Lord Hemsworth, as he guided Di to an armchair. Miss Fane shook her head. "'They won't let me in,' she said. "'They've taken him to his room, and they won't let anyone in.' "'Who is with him?' said Di, in a loud, hoarse voice that made everyone look at her. She did not see what everyone else did namely that the neck and breast of her grey coat was drenched with blood, not hers. "'The doctor and his sister are with him. They were both on the ice at the time. I think Lord Elver is there, too, and his valet.' Lord Hemsworth went into the dining-hall, and came back with a glass of champagne and a roll. "'Bring things out to the people,' he said to the bewildered servants. "'They won't come in here for them.' And they followed with trays of wine and soup. Without making her conspicuous, he was thus able to force Di to drink and eat. She remembered afterwards his wearying pertinacity till she had finished what he brought her. The men, most of whom were exhausted by the pursuit of the assassin, or by carrying John up the steep ascent, drank large quantities of spirits. Archie, quite worn out, fell heavily asleep in an oak chair. The women were beginning to disappear in twos and threes. Everyone was dead beat. It was Lord Hemsworth who took the onus of giving directions, who told the servants to put out the lights from all the windows. Miss Fane was of no more use than a sheep waked at midnight, for an opinion on New Zealand lamb would have been. She stood about and ate sandwiches because they were handed to her, although she and the other chaperons had just partaken of roast turkey, went at intervals into the picture gallery, at the end of which John's room was 
and came back, shaking her head. It was Lord Hemsworth who helped Di to her room while Miss Fane accompanied them upstairs. Di's room was still brilliantly lighted. Lord Hemsworth lingered on the threshold. "'You will promise me to take off that damp gown at once,' he said. Somehow there seemed nothing peculiar in the authoritative attitude which he had assumed towards Di. She and Miss Fane took it as a matter of course. "'Yes, change all her things,' said Miss Fane. "'Quite right, quite right.' "'Where is your maid? Can you get her?' asked Lord Hemsworth uneasily. "'I have no maid,' said Di, trying and failing to unfasten her grey furred coat. He winced as he saw her touch it. Then an idea seeming to strike him, he closed the door and went downstairs again. The servant put out the lamps at the windows of the picture gallery, leaving, with unusual forethought, one or two burning in the long expanse in case of need. In the shadow at the further end, near John's room, a bent figure was sitting, silently rocking itself to and fro. It had been there whenever he had ventured into the gallery. It was there still. It was Mitty. Mitty in her best violet silk that would stand of itself, and her black satin apron and her gold brooch with the mosaic of the Colosseum that John had brought her from Rome. She raised her wet face out of her apron as the young man touched her gently on the shoulder. "'They won't let me in to see him, sir,' said Mitty, the round tears running down her cheeks and hopping on to her violet silk. "'Me that nursed him since he was a baby. He was put into my arms, sir, when he was born. I took him for the month, and they won't let me in.' "'They will presently.' said Lord Hemsworth. He'll be asking for you, you'll see. And then how vexed he will be if he sees you've been trying. And the warming pan, sir, gasped Mitty, shaken with silent sobs, pointed to that article laid on the settee. I got it ready myself. I was as quick as quick, and a bit of brown sugar in it to keep off the pain. And they said they did not want it, as if I didn't know what he'd like. He'll want his old Mitty, and he won't know they are keeping me away from him. "'Someone wants you very much,' said Lord Hemsworth. "'Poor Miss Tempest, and she has no maid with her. "'She's not fit to be left to herself. "'Won't you go and see to her, Mitty?' "'But Mitty shook her head. "'He may ask for me,' she said. "'I will stay here and come for you the first minute he asks,' said Lord Hemsworth, "'moving the rejected warming-pan and sitting down beside her on the hot settee. "'Poor Miss Tempest, and she tried so hard to save him. "'Won't you go to her?' She has only Miss Fane with her. Miss Fane, said Mitty, evidently with the recollection of a long-standing feud. Much could she do a body, doesn't know chalk from cheese. She didn't even know when Master John had got the measles, though the spots was out all over him. Tell you nettle rash nurse, she says to me. And the same when he had them little ulcers in his throat. Miss Fane, indeed. And after a little more persuasion, Mitty consented to go, if he promised to come to her if John asked for her. Lord Hemsworth gave a sigh of relief as Mitty went reluctantly away. He was in mortal anxiety about Di. He had a nervous misgiving increased by his feeling of masculine helplessness to do anything further for her, lest she should fall ill or faint alone in that gaily lighted room. For, of course, Miss Fane would not have remained. As indeed was the case, she was yawning herself out of the room when Mitty appeared. "'That's it, that's it,' she said, evidently relieved. "'Get to bed, dime, no use sitting up. We shall hear you in the morning.' And she departed to her own room. Di turned her white, exhausted face slowly towards the old woman, and vainly tried to frame a question. Mitty's maternal instinct was aroused by the sight of her lambs, Miss Dinah, sitting in her mist-damped clothes, which steamed where the warmth of the fire reached them. She made no effort to take off her walking things, but she was passive under Mitty's hands, as the latter unfastened them and wrapped her in her warm dressing gown. "'I can't go to bed, Mitty,' said Di hoarsely, holding her gown. "'Don't make me. Let me come and sit in the nursery with you. We shall be nearer there, and then I shall hear. There's no one to come and tell me here.' The girl clung convulsively to the old woman, and the two went together to the nursery and Mitty, after putting her guest into the rocking-chair by the fire, went down once more to ask for news. But there was no news. John was still unconscious, and the doctor would say nothing. 
Presently Mitty came tearfully back and sat down on the other side of the fire. Old Hemsworth, who was sitting up with Archie, had promised to come to the nursery the moment there was any change. The nursery still bore traces of the little party that had broken up so disastrously, for Mitty had invited the elite of the village ladies to view the carnival from the nursery windows. The rock buns, for which Mitty was celebrated, and one of Mrs. Alcock's best cakes, were still on the table and Mitty's fluted silver teapot with a little nest of clean cups round it. Presently she got up, and, opening the corner cupboard, began to put them away. But the impulse of tidying was forgotten, and she caught sight of John's robin mug on the top shelf. She took it down, and stood holding it in her old, withered hands. "'I'll give it him myself,' she said, on his birthday when he was five years old. Twenty-four years ago, come June.' I thought some of his mother's family would have remembered his birthday if his father didn't. I thought something would have come by post. But there wasn't so much as a letter. And Mrs. Alcock gave him the tin plate with the soldier on it. But I never let him eat off it. And we had Barker's little nephew to tea as he was learning to shoemackle, but nobody took no notice of his birthday except me and Mrs. Alcock. And when he went to school I kept his mug and his toys. He never had a many toys, but what there was I have them and his clothes, my dear, everything since he was born, from his little cambric shirts. I have them all, put away with a bit of camphor to his velvet suit, as I took him to Moor York to be measured for, on purpose to make him look pretty to his papa when he came home from abroad. But he never took a bit of notice of him, never. Mitty sat down by the fire, still holding the mug. And a lace collar he had with it, real lace, the best as money could buy. I might spend what I liked in him, but no one ever took no notice of him, not even in his first sailors, and he with his pretty ways and his grave talk. Mrs. Alcock and me has often cried over the things he'd say. There's his crib still in the night nursery by my bed. I could not sleep without it was there. Little blankets and sheets and pillow slips as belong, all put away, and not an arm mould upon em. Oh, dear miss, many's the time I got em out and aired em, thinking maybe the day had come when he would have a babby of his own and I should hold it in my old arms before I died. And even if I was gone, they'd be already with the bassinet only wanting muslin to it. And now, oh, my lamb, my lamb, and they won't let his old Mitty go to him. Amid his grief broke into a paroxysm of sobbing. Di looked at the old woman rocking herself backwards and forwards, and, rising unsteadily, she went and knelt down by her, putting her arms round her in silence. She had no comfort to give him words. It seemed if her strong young heart were breaking. But she realised that Mitty's anguish for a love, knit up into so many faithful years, was greater than hers. As she knelt, a step came along the creaking garret gallery with its uneven flooring. It was Lord Hemsworth. He stood in the doorway with the wan light of the morning behind him, his face looked pinched and aged. "'He's better,' he said. "'He has recovered consciousness and has spoken. The other doctor has arrived, and they think all will go well.' And the two women who loved John clung and sobbed together. Lord Hemsworth looked fixedly at Di, and went out. End of Volume 3 Chapter 3《Volume Three, Chapter Four of Diana Tempest by Mary Chumley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Volume Three, Chapter Four. Toute passion nuisible attire comme le gouffre par le vertige. La faiblesse de volonté amène la faiblesse de tête, et l'abîme, malgré son horreur, fascine alors comme un asile. Amiel. People said that John had a charmed life. The divergence of an eighth of an inch, of a hundredth part of an inch, of a hair's breadth, and the little bead that passed right through his neck would have pierced the jugular artery, and John would have added one more to the long list of names in Overly Church. As it was, when once the direction of the bullet had been ascertained, he was pronounced to be in little danger. He rallied steadily, and without relapse. People said that he bore a charmed life, and they began to say something more, namely, 
that it was an object to somebody that it should be wiped out. Men are not shot at for nothing. John was not an Irish landlord. Someone evidently bore him a grudge. Society instantly formed several more or less discreditable reasons to account for John's being the object of someone's revenge. Half-forgotten rumours of Archie's doings were revived with John's name affixed to them. Decidedly there had been some entanglement, and John had brought his fate upon himself. Colonel Tempest, just returned from foreign travel, heard the matter discussed at his club. His opinion was asked as to the truth of the reports, but he only shrugged his shoulders, and it was supposed that he could not deny them. Dyes, Lady Alice Fane's, and Miss Crupp's name were all equally associated with John's in the different versions of the accident. Colonel Tempest did not go to see his daughter. She had been telegraphed for the morning after the ice carnival by Mrs. Courtney, who had actually developed with the thaw the bronchitis which she had dreaded throughout the frost. Di, and Archie, whose leave was up, returned to town together for once. Archie had experienced a distinct, though shamed, pang of disappointment when John's state was pronounced to be favourable. All night long, as he had sat waking and dozing beside the gallery fire opposite Lord Hemsworth's motionless, wakeful figure, visions of wealth passed in spite of himself before his mind, visions of foreign hands and screaming champagne suppers and smashing things he could afford to pay for, and running his own horses on the turf. He did not want John to die. He had been dreadfully shocked when he first caught sight of the stony, upturned face almost beneath his feet, and had strained every nerve in his body to overtake the murderer. He did not want John to go where he, Archie, would have been terrified to go himself. But he wanted the things John had, which his father had often told him should by rights have been his, and they could not have had them at the one and the same time. He could not understand his father's fervent, thank God, when he assured him that John was out of danger. A miss is as good as a mile, said Archie, with his smallest grin. He was desperately short of money again by this time, and he had no one to apply to. He knew enough of John to be aware that nothing was to be expected from that quarter. Twenty-four hours ago he had thought, how could he have helped it? that perhaps there would be no further trouble on that irksome, wearisome trap subject. For lack of money and the annoyance entailed by procuring it was the thorn in Archie's flesh. But now the annoyance was still there, beginning as it were all over again, owing to John. Madeline would lend him money, he knew, but he would be a cad to, to take it. He could not think of such a thing, he said to himself, as he turned it over in his mind. The ice carnival and John's escape were a nine days' wonder. In ten days it was forgotten for a cause célèbre by everyone except Colonel Tempest. Colonel Tempest had had a fairly pleasant time abroad. While his small stock of ready money lasted, the remainder of the five hundred subtracted from the sum he had returned to John after his interview with Larkin, he had really almost enjoyed himself. He picked up a few old companions of the hanger-on species at Baden and Homburg, and had given them dinners. He was always open-handed. He had the natural predilection for the society of his social inferiors, which generally accompanies a predilection for being deferred to, and regarded as a person of importance. He was under the impression that he was the most liberal-minded of men in the choice of his companions, and without the social prejudices of his class. He had won a little at Baccarat. His health also had improved. On his return in December to the lodgings which he had left in such a panic in July, he told himself that he had been in a morbid state of health, that he had taken things too much to heart, that he had been oversensitive, that there was no need to be afraid. Five months had elapsed. It would be all right. And it had been all right for about a month, and then— If the distressing theory that virtue is its own reward has any truth— Surely sin is its own punishment. The old monotonous pains took Colonel Tempest. It is a popular axiom among peoples in robust health that others labouring long under a painful disease become accustomed to it. It is perhaps as true as all axioms, however freely laid down by persons in one state respecting the feelings of others in a state of which they are ignorant, 
can be. Continual dropping of water wears away the stone. The stone ought, of course, to put up an umbrella, anyone can see that, or shift its position, but it seldom does so. There was a continual dropping of a slowly diluted torture on the crumbling sandstone of Colonel Tempest's heart. A few months of intermission only rendered more acute the agony of the inevitable recommencement. As he felt in July after the fire in John's lodgings, so he felt now, just the same again, all over again, only worse. The porous sandstone was wearing down. He wandered like a ghost in the snowy places in the park, for snow had followed the thaw, or paced for hours by the serpentine, staring at the water. Once, in a path across the park, he suddenly caught sight of John walking slowly in the direction of Kensington. The young man passed within a couple of yards of him without seeing him, his head bent and his eyes upon the ground. "'It is his ghost,' said Colonel Tempest to himself, clutching the railing, and looking back at the receding figure with an access of shuddering horror. Another figure passed, a heavy man in an ulster. "'He's been followed,' thought Colonel Tempest. "'It is Swain, and he is following him.' He rushed, panting after the second figure, and overtook it at a meeting of the ways. "'Swain!' he gasped. "'For mercy's sake, Swain, don't—' A benevolent elderly face turned and peered at him in the twilight, and Colonel Tempest remembered that Swain was dead. Uh, "'My name is Smith,' said the man, and after waiting a moment, passed on. In a flash of memory Colonel Tempest saw Swain's huddled figure crouching in the disordered bed, and the checked trousers over a chair, and the candle on the window-sill bent double by the heat. That had been the manner of Swain's departure. How had he come to forget he was dead, and that John was laid up at Overley? "'I'm going mad,' he said to himself. "'That will be the end. I shall go mad and tell everything.' The new idea haunted him. He could not shake it off. There was nothing in the wide world to turn to for a change of thought. If he fell asleep at night, he was waked by the sound of his own voice, to find himself sitting up in bed, talking loudly of he knew not what. Once he heard himself call Swain's and John's names aloud into the listening darkness, and broke into a cold sweat at the thought that he might have been heard in the next room. Perhaps the other lodger, the young man with the red hair, cramming for the army, knew everything by this time. Perhaps the lodging-house people had been listening at the door and would give him in charge in the morning. Did he not at that very moment hear furtive steps and whispering on the landing? He rushed out to see the thin tabby-cat, the walking funeral of the beetles and mice of the establishment, slip noiselessly downstairs, and he returned to his room shivering from head to foot, to toss and shudder until the morning, and then furtively eye the landlady and her daughter in curl-papers. More days passed. Colonel Tempest had had doubts at first, but gradually he became convinced that the people in the house knew. He was sure of it by the look in their faces if he passed them on the stairs. It was merely a question of time. They were waiting to make certain before they informed against him. Perhaps they had written to John. There was no news of John, except a rumour in the world, that he was to stand at the coming general election. Colonel Tempest became the prey of an ide fix. When John came forward on the hustings, he would be shot at and killed. He became as certain of it as if it had already happened. At times he believed it had happened, that he had been present and had seen him fall forward, and it was he, Colonel Tempest, who had shot him, and had been taken red-handed with one of his old regimental pistols smoking in his hand. Colonel Tempest had those pistols somewhere. One day he got them out and looked at them, and spent a long time rubbing them up. They used to hang crosswise under a photograph of himself in uniform in his wife's little drawing-room. He recollected, with the bitterness that accompanies the remembrance of the waste of lavished affections, how he had sat with his wife and child a whole wet afternoon polishing up those pistols, while another man in his place would have gone off to his club. Colonel Tempest always knew what that other man would have done. And Di had been gentle and affectionate, and had had a colour for once and had played with her creeping child like a cat with its kitten. And they'd had tea together afterwards, sitting on the sofa with the child asleep between them. Ah! If she'd only been always like that, he thought, as he remembered the cloud that, owing to her uncertain temper, 
had gradually settled on his home life. An intense bitterness was springing afresh in Colonel Tempest's mind against his dead wife, against his dead brother, against Swain, against his children who never came near him. Di was nursing Mrs. Courtney and bronchitis, but that was of no account. Against the world in general, which did not care what became of him. No one cared. They'll be sorry some day, he said to himself. And still the waking nightmare remained of seeing John fall, and of finding he had shot him himself. More days passed. And gradually, among the tottering debris of a life undermined from its youth, an other thought began, mole-like, to delve and creep in the darkness. Truly the way of transgressors is hard. No one cared what he suffered, what he went through. This was the constant refrain of these latter days. He had paroxysms of angry tears of self-pity with his head in his hands, his heart rent to think of himself sitting bowed with anguish by his solitary fireside. Love holds the casting vote in the destinies of most of us. There is only one love which rings the heart beyond human endurance, the love of self. And yet more days. The sun gave no light by day, neither the moon by night. To the severe cold of January a mild February had succeeded. March was close at hand. The hope and yearning of the spring was in the air already. Already in Kensington Gardens the silly birds had begun to sing, and the snowdrops and the little regiments of crocuses had come up in double file to listen. On this particular afternoon a pale London sun was shining like a new shilling in the sky, striking as many sparks as he could out of the round pond. There was quite a regatta at that cow's of nursery shipping. The mild wind was just strong enough to take sailing vessels across. The big man of war belonging to the big melancholy man who seemed open to an offer, the yachts and the little fishing smacks, everything with a sail, got over sooner or later. The tiny hollow boats with seats were being towed along the edge in leading reins. A wooden doll with joints took advantage of its absence of costume to drop out of the boat in which it was being conveyed and take a swim in the open. But it was recovered. An old gentleman with spectacles hooked it out with the end of his umbrella in a moment, quite pleased to be of use. The little boys shouted, the little girls tossed their manes, and careered round the pool on slender black legs. Solemn babies looked on from perambulators. The big man started the big man of war again, and the whole fleet came behind in its wake. Colonel Tempest was sitting on a seat near the landing-place where the ship-owners had run to touch their property a moment ago. His hand was clenched on something he held under his overcoat. "'Where the big ship touches the edge,' he said to himself. They came slowly across the pool in a flock. Every little boy shrieked to every other little boy of his acquaintance to observe how his particular craft was going. The big man alone was perfectly apathetic though his priceless possession was the first, of course. He began walking slowly round. Half the children were the landing before him, calling to their boats and stretching out their hands towards them. The big one touched land. "'Not this time,' said Colonel Tem to himself. "'Next time.' How often he had said that already! How often his hand had failed him when the moment when he and that other self had agreed upon had arrived! How often he had gone guiltily back to the rooms to which he had not intended to return, and had lain down once more in the bed which had become an accomplice to the torture of every hour of darkness. Between the horror of returning once again, and the horror of the step into another darkness, his soul oscillated with the feeble violence of despair. He remembered the going back of yesterday. "'I'll not go back again,' he said to himself with the passion of a spoiled child. "'I will not, I will not.' "'It's time to go home, Master Georgie,' said the nursery-maid. "'Just one more, Bessie,' pleaded the boy. "'Just one single once more.' "'Well, then, it must be the last time, mind,' said the good-natured arbiter of fate, turning the perambulator and pushing it along the edge, while the occupant of the same added to the hilarity of the occasion by beating a much-chewed musical rattle against the wheel. THE LAST TIME. 
a chance word seized upon Colonel Tempest's shuddering, panic-stricken mind, and held it as in a vice. "'Next time,' he said over and over to himself, "'next time shall really be the last time, really the last, the very last.' The boats were coming across again, struggling wide of each other. How quick! Yet what an eternity in coming! The top-heavy boat with the red sail would be the first. It had been started long before the others. The wind caught it near the edge. It would turn over. No, it righted itself. It neared. It bobbed in the ripple at the brink. It touched. Colonel Tempest's mind had become quite numb. He only knew that for some imperative reason which he had forgotten, he must pull the trigger. He half pulled it. Then again, more decidedly. There was a report. It stunned him back to a kind of consciousness of what he had done. But he felt nothing. There was a great silence, and then a shrieking of terrified children, and a glimpse of agitated people close at hand, and others running towards him. The man with the big boat under his arm said, By gum! Colonel Tempest looked at him. He felt nothing. Had he failed? The smoke came curling out at his collar, and something dropped from his nerveless hand and lay gleaming on the grass. There was a sound of many waters in his ears. "'You might have spared the children,' said a man's voice, tremulous with indignation. "'That is always the way. No one thinks of me,' thought Colonel Tempest. And the round pond, and the growing crowd, and the child nearest to him with its convulsed face, all turned slowly before his eyes, slid up, and disappeared. End of Volume 3, Chapter 4volume 3 chapter 5 of diana tempest by mary chumley this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by simon evers volume 3 chapter 5 vous avez bien froid la belle comment vous appelez-vous les amours et les yeux d'eau de nous ceci sont des clous je suis l'amour dit-elle qui est la branche de où victor hugo as John lay impatiently patient upon his bed in the round oak-panelled room at Overley, during the weeks that followed his accident, his thoughts by day and by night varied no more than the note of a chaffinch in the trees outside. Oh, let the solid earth not fall beneath my feet, before I too have found what some have found so sweet. That was the one constant refrain. The solid earth had nearly failed beneath his feet, Nearly, nearly. If the world might but cohere together and not fly off into space, if body and soul might but hold together till he had seen die once more, till he knew for certain from her own lips that she loved him. Unloved by any woman until now, wistfully ignorant of woman's tenderness, even of its first alphabet learnt at a mother's knee, unread in all its later language, in these days of convalescence a passionate craving was upon him to drink deep of that untasted cup which some have found so sweet. He had Mitty, and Mitty at least was radiantly happy during these weeks, with John fast in bed, and in a condition to dispense with other nursing than hers. She sat with him by the hour together, mending his socks and shirts, for she would not suffer anyone to touch his clothes except herself and discoursing to him about Di, a subject which he soon perceived never failed to interest him. "'Miss Dinah,' Mitty would say for the twentieth time, but without wearying her audience, "'now there's a fine upstanding lady for my lamb.' "'Lady Aris Fane is very pretty, too,' John would remark, with the happy knack of self-concealment peculiar to the ostrich and the sterner sex. "Hoot," Mitty replied, "'she's nothing beside Miss Dinah.' If you have Lady Fane with her silly ways, and so snappy to her maid, you repent every hair of your head. You take Miss Dinah, my dear, as is only waiting to be asked. She wants you, my precious, Mitty never failed to add. I tell you it's as plain as the nose on your face. A simile the force of which could not fail to strike him. It's not that Lord Hemstitch, for all his pretty looks, it's you. And John told himself he was a fool, and then secretly felt under the pillow, for a certain pencilled note, 
which Di had left with the doctor on her hurried departure to London the morning after the ice carnival. It had been given to him when he was able to read letters. It was a short note. There was very little in it, and a great deal left out. It did not even go over the page. But nevertheless John was so very foolish as to keep it under his pillow, and when he was promoted to his clothes it followed into his pocket. Even the envelope had a certain value in his eyes. Had not her hand touched it, and written his name upon it? Lindo and Fritz, who had been consumed with ennui during John's illness, were almost as excited as their master, when he hobbled, on Mitty's arm, into the morning-room for luncheon. Lindo was aware of sediments of beef-tea and sticks of toast. Fritz, who had had a plethora of whites of poached eggs, sniffed anxiously at the luncheon tray with its roast pheasant. There were tricks and Albert biscuits after luncheon, succeeded by heavy snoring on the hearth-rug. John was almost as delighted as they were to leave his sick-room. It was the first step towards going to London. When should he ring permission from his doctor to go up on urgent business? Five days? Seven days? Surely in a week at latest he would see die again. He made a little journey round the room to show himself how robust he was becoming, and wound up the old watches lying in the blue du roi sèvre tray, making the repeat one after the other, because Di had once done so. Would Di make this her sitting-room? It was warm and sunny. Perhaps she would like the outlook across the bowling green and low, ivy-coloured balustrade away to the moors. It had been his mother's sitting-room. His poor mother. He looked up at the pretty vacant face that hung over the fireplace. He had looked at it so often that it had ceased to make any definite impression on him. He wondered vaguely whether the happy or the unhappy hours had preponderated in this room in which she was wont to sit, the very furniture of which remained the same as in her quickly finished day. And then he wondered whether, if she had lived, Di would have liked her for it was still early in the afternoon, and he had positively nothing to do. He tried to write a few necessary letters in the absence of Mitty, who was busy washing his handkerchiefs, but he soon gave up the attempt. The exertion made his head ache, as he had been warned it would, so he propelled himself across the room to his low chair by the window. What should he do till tea-time? If only he had asked Mitty for a bit of wash-leather, he might have polished up the brass slave-collar in the Satsuma dish. He took it up and turned it in his hands. It was a heavy collar enough, with the owner's name engraved thereon. Roger Tempest, 1698. "'It must have galled him,' said John to himself, and he took up the gag next and put it into his mouth, and then had considerable difficulty in getting it out again. What on earth should he do with himself till tea-time? One of the bits of Venetian glass standing in the central niche of the lac cabinet at his elbow had lost its handle. He got up to examine it, and, thinking the handle might have been put aside within, pushed back the glass in the centre of the niche, which, as in so many of its species, shut off a small enclosed space between the tiers of drawers. The glass door on its little pillars opened inwards, but not without difficulty. It was clogged with dust. The handle of the Venetian glass was not inside. There was nothing inside but a little old old, very old, glue bottle, standing on an envelope, and a broken china cup beside it with the broken bits in it. The hand that had put them away so carefully to mend, on a day that never came, was dust. They remained. John took out the cup. It matched one that stood in the pitch gallery. The pieces seemed to be all there. He began to fit them together with the pleased interest of a child. He'd really found something to do at last. At the bottom of the cup was a key. It was a very small key with a large head, matching the twisted handles of the drawers. This was becoming interesting. John put down the cup and fitted the key into the lock of one of the drawers. Yes, it was the right one. He became quite excited. Half the cabinets in the house were locked, and would not open. Of some he had found the keys by diligent search, but the keys of others had never turned up. Here was evidently one. The key turned with difficulty, but still it did turn, and the drawer opened. The dust had crept over everything, over all the faded silks and bobbins and feminine gear of which it was half full. 
John disturbed it, and then sneezed till he thought he should kill himself. But he survived to find among the tangle of work a tiny white garment half made, with the rusted needle still in it. He took it out. What was it? Doll's clothing. And then he realised that it was a little shirt, and that his mother had probably been making it for him, and had not had time to finish it. John held the baby's shirt that he ought to have worn in a very reverent hand, and looked back at the picture. That bit of unfinished work begun for him seemed to bring her nearer to him than she had ever been before. Yes, it was hers. There was her ivory work-box with her initials in silver and turquoise on it, and her small gold thimble had rolled into a corner of the drawer. John put back the little remnant of a love that had never reached him into the drawer with a clumsy gentleness, and locked it up. "'I'll show it to die some day,' he said. The other drawers bore record. There were small relics of girlhood, ball cards, cotillon ribbons, a mug with Marion Fane inscribed in gold on it, a slim book on confirmation. One of Darling Spot's curls was wrapped in tissue paper. John did not even know who Spot was, except that from the appearance of the lock he had probably been a black retriever. A child's little possessions touched John's heart. He looked at each one, and put it tenderly back. Some of the drawers were empty, in some were smart notepaper with faded networks of silver and blue initials on them. In another was an ornamental purse with money in it and a few unpaid bills. John wondered what his mother would have been like now if she had lived. Her sister, Miss Fane, had a weakness for gorgeous notepaper and smart work baskets, which he had often regarded with astonishment. It had never struck him that his mother might have had the same tastes. He opened another drawer. More fancy work. A ball of silk half-wound on a card. A roll of vari-coloured embroidery. And, thrust in among them, a half-opened packet of letters. The torn cover which still surrounded them was addressed to Mrs. Tempest, Overy Castle, Yorkshire. Inside the cover was a loose sheet which fell apart from the package, tied up separately. On it was written, in a large cramped hand that John knew well, I dare say you are wise in your generation to prefer to break with me. Tout lasse, and then naturally on se range. I return your letters as you wish it, and as you have been kind enough to burn mine already, I will ask you to commit this last effusion to the flames. The paper was without date or signature. John opened the packet which contained many letters, all in one handwriting, which he recognised as his mother's. He read them one by one, and as he read, the pity in his face gave place to a white indignation. Poor, foolish, foolish letters, to be read after a lapse of eight and twenty years. John realised how very silly his poor mother had been how worldly wise and selfish someone else had been. "'We ought to be married, darling,' said one of the later letters, dated from Overly, evidently after her marriage with Mr. Tempest. "'I see now we ought. You said you were too poor, and you would not bear to see me poor. But I would not have minded that one bit. Did I not tell you so a hundred times? I would have learnt to cook and mend clothes and everything, if only I might have been with you.' It is much worse now, feeling my heart is breaking, and yours too, and fate keeping us apart. And you must not write to me any more now I am married, or me to you. It is not right. Mother would be vexed if she knew. I am quite sure she would. So this is the very last to my dearest darling Freddy, from poor Marian. Alas! There were many, many more from poor Marian after the very last little, vacillating, feeble, gilt-edged notes, with every other word underdashed, some short and hurried, some long and reproachful, sad landmarks of each step of a blindfold wandering on the brink of the abyss, clinging to the hand that was pushing her over. The last letter was a very long one. "'You have no heart,' wrote the pointed, slanted handwriting. "'You do not care what I suffer. I do not believe now you ever cared.' You say it would be an act of folly to tell my husband, but you know I was always silly. But it is not necessary. I am sure he knows. I feel it. He says nothing, but I know he knows. Oh, if I were only dead and in my grave! 
and if only the baby might die too, as I hope it will, as I pray to God it will. If I die and it lives, I don't know what will happen to it. Remember, if he casts it off, it is your child. Oh, Freddy, surely it can't be all quite a mistake. You were fond of me once before you made me wicked, and when I am dead you won't feel so angry and impatient with me as you do now. And if the child lives and has no friend, you will remember it is yours, won't you? I am so miserable that I think God will surely let me die. And the child may come any day now. Last night I felt so ill that I dared not put off any longer, and this morning I burned all your letters to me, every one, even the first about the white violets. Do you remember that letter? It is so long ago now. No, you've forgotten. It is only I who remember, because it was only I who cared. And I burned the locket you gave me with your hair in it. It felt like dying to burn it. Everything is all quite gone. But I can't rest until you've sent me back my letters. I can't trust you to burn them. I know what trusting to you means. Send them all back to me, and I will burn them myself. And it be quick, be quick, there is so little time. If they come when I am ill, someone else may read them. I hope if I live I shall never see your face again. And if I die, I hope God will keep you away from me. Oh, I don't mean it, Freddy, I don't mean it. Only I am so miserable that I don't know what I write. God forgive you. I would too if I thought you cared whether I did or not. God forgive us both. M. John looked back at the cover of the packet. The overly postmark was blurred but legible. June the 8th, and the year... It was his birthday. Her lover had sent back her letters then, with those few harsh lines telling her she was wise in her generation. Even the last he had returned, and they had reached her on the morning of the day her child was born. Had it been a sunny day, with no fire on the hearth before which Linda and Fritz now lay stretched, into which she could have dropped that packet? Had she not had time even to burn them? She had glanced at them, evidently. Had she been interrupted, and had she thrust them for the moment with her work into the drawer? Futile inquiry. He would never know. And she had had her wish. She had been allowed to die, to hide herself away in the grave. John's heart swelled with sorrowing pity, as at the sight of a child suffering. She had been very little more. She should have her other wish, too. He gathered up the letters, and, stepping over the dogs, dropped them into the heart of the fire. They were in the safe-keeping of the flames at last. They reached their destination at last, but a little late, twenty-eight years too late. And suddenly, as he watched them burn, like a thunderbolt falling and tearing up the ground on which he stood, came the thought, Then I am illegitimate. The minute hand of the clock on the mantelpiece had made a complete circuit since John had dropped the letters into the fire. Yet he had not stirred from the armchair into which he had staggered the moment afterwards. His fixed eyes looked straight in front of him. His lips moved at intervals. "'I am illegitimate,' he said to himself, over and over again. No, it was a nightmare, an hallucination of illness, how many delusions he had had during the last few weeks. He should wake up presently and find he had been torturing himself for nothing. If only Mitty would come back. He should laugh at himself presently. In the meanwhile, and as it were in spite of himself, certain facts were taking a new significance, were arranging themselves into an unexpected, horrible sequence. Link joined itself to Link and lengthened to a chain. He remembered his father's evident dislike of him. He remembered how Colonel Tempest had contested the succession when he died. As he had lost the case, John had supposed, when he came to an age to suppose anything, that the slander was without foundation, especially as Mr. Tempest had recognised him as his son. He had known of his existence, of course, but like the rest of the world had half forgotten it. That Lord Frederick Fane, evidently the Freddy of the letters, was even his supposed father, had never crossed his mind. If he was like the Fanes, why should he not be so? He might as naturally resemble his mother's as his father's family. He recalled Colonel Tempest's inveterate dislike of him, Archie's thankless reception of anything and everything he did for him. "'I believe,' said John, in astonished recollection of divers passages between himself and them, "'I believe they think I know all the time, 
and deliberately keeping them out. That, then, was the reason why Mr. Tempest had not discarded him. To recognise him as his son was his surest means of striking at the hated brother who came next in the entail. "'I was made use of,' said John, grinding his teeth. There was no use fighting against it. This hideous, profane incredibility was the truth. Even without the letters to read over again, he knew it was true. "'Remember, if he casts it out, it is your child.' The long dead lips still spoke. His mother had pronounced his doom herself. I am illegitimate, said John to himself, and he remembered to die and hid his face in his hands while his mother simpered at him from the wall. The solid earth had failed beneath his feet. Let us beware how we sin, inasmuch as by God's decree we do not pay. We could almost conceive a right to do as we will, if we could keep the penalty to ourselves and pay to the uttermost farthing. But not from us is the inevitable payment required. The young, the innocent, the unborn, smart for us, are made bankrupt for us. From them is exacted the deficit which we have left behind. The sins of the father are visited on the children heavily. Heavily. End of Volume 3, Chapter 5Volume three, chapter six of Diana Tempest by Mary Chumley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Volume three, chapter six. What name doth joy most borrow when life is fair? Tomorrow. George Eliot. On her hurried return to London the morning after the ice carnival, Di found Mrs. Courtney in that condition of illness not necessarily dangerous in which the linseed poultice and the steam-kettle and the complexion of the beef-tea are the objects of an all-absorbing interest to the exclusion of every other subject. Di was glad not to be questioned upon the one subject that was never absent from her thoughts. As Mrs. Courtney became convalescent, she was able to leave her for an hour or two, and pace in the quieter parts of Kensington Gardens. Happiness, like sorrow, is easier to bear out of doors, and I had a lurking feeling that would hardly bear being put into words, but was none the worse company for that, that the crocuses and the first bird note in the trees and the pale sky knew her secret and rejoiced with her. John would come to her. He was getting well, and the first day he could he would come to her and tell her once more that he loved her. And she? Impossible. Incredible as it seemed, she should tell him that she loved him too. Imagination stopped short there. Everything after that was a complete blank. They would be engaged. They would be married. Other people who loved did so. Words, mere words applicable to other people, but not to her and John. Could such impossible happiness ever come about? Never, never. She must be mad to think of such a thing. It could not be. Yet it was so. It was coming, it was sure, this new, incomprehensible, dreaded happiness, of which, now that it was almost within her trembling hand, she hardly dared to think. "'Die,' said Mrs. Courtney one afternoon as she came in from her walk, "'there is a paragraph in the paper about John. He's going to contest that seat at the general election in opposition to the present radical member. Did he say anything about it while you were at Overley? It must have been arranged some time ago.' No, Granny, he did not mention it. I'm glad he's taking part in politics at last. It is time. I may not live to see it, but he will make his mark. I'm sure he will, said Di. Mrs. Courtney looked in some perplexity at her granddaughter. It seemed to her from Di's account that she had taken John's accident very placidly. She had not forgotten the girl's apparent callousness when his life had been endangered in the mine. It was very provoking to Mrs. Courtney that this beautiful creature, whom she had taken out for nearly four years, seemed to have too much heart to be willing to marry without love, and too little to fall genuinely in love. Mrs. Courtney had gone to considerable expense in providing her with a new and becoming morning gown for that visit, and Di had managed to lose one of the lace handkerchiefs she had lent her, 
and had come back unengaged after all. Mrs. Courtney, who had taken care to accept the invitation for her without consulting her, and had ordered the gown in spite of Di's remonstrances, felt keenly that if Di had refused John, she had gone to that social gathering under false pretenses. "'Di,' she said, "'I seldom ask questions, but I have been wondering during the last few days whether you have anything to tell me or not.' Considering that this was not a question, it was certainly couched in a form conducive to eliciting information. "'I have, and I have not,' said Di. "'Of course I know what you expected, but it did not happen.' "'You mean John did not propose to you?' "'No, Granny.' Mrs. Courtney was silent. She was prepared to be seriously annoyed with Di, and it seemed John was in fault after all. There is no relaxation for a natural irritability in being angry with a person a hundred miles off. "'I think he meant to,' said Di, turning pink. Mrs. Courtney saw the change of colour with surprise. "'My dear,' she said, "'do you care for him?' "'Yes,' said Di, looking straight at her grandmother. "'I am very thankful,' said Mrs. Courtney. "'I have nothing left to wish for.' "'I believe I have sometimes done you an injustice,' she said tremulously, after wiping her spectacles. "'I thought you valued your own freedom and independence too much to marry. "'It is difficult to advise the young to give their love if they don't want to. "'Yet, as one grows old, one sees that the very best things we women have "'lose all their virtue if we keep them to ourselves.' Our love, if we withhold it, our freedom, if we retain it, what are they later on in life but dead seed in our hands? Our best is ours only to give. Our part is to give it to someone who is worthy of it. I think John is worthy. I wish he had managed to speak and that it were all settled. It is really settled, said Di. Now and then I feel frightened and think I may have made a mistake, but I know all the time that is foolish. I'm certain he cares for me, and I'm quite sure he knows I care for him. Granny, blushing furiously, I often wish now that I had not said quite so many idiotic things about love and marriage before I knew anything about them. Do you remember how I used to, to favour you with my views about them? I don't think they were exactly idiotic. Only the elect hesitate to pronounce opinions on subjects of which they are ignorant. I have heard extremely intelligent men say things quite as silly about housekeeping and the rearing of infants. You, like them, spoke according to your lights, which were small. I don't know about charming men. There are not any nowadays. But it is always a pity when charming women talk of things that they don't understand. We should not have many subjects of conversation if we did not, said Di. And the old woman and the young one embraced each other with tears in their eyes. End of Volume 3, Chapter 6《Vol. 3, Chapter 7 of Diana Tempest by Mary Chumley》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers Vol. 3, Chapter 7 O oh, well for him whose will is strong! Tennyson there come times in our lives when the mind lies broken on the revolving wheel of our thought. I am illegitimate. That was the one thought which made John's bed for him at night, which followed him throughout the spectral day, until it brought him back to the spectral night again. It was a quiver in which were many poisoned arrows. Because the first that struck him was well-nigh unbearable, the others did not fail to reach their mark. If he were nameless and penniless, he could not marry Di. That was the first arrow. Such marriages are possible only in books, and in that sacred profession which, in spite of numerous instances to the contrary, believes that the Lord will provide. Di would not be allowed to marry him, even if she were willing to do so. And after a time, a long time perhaps, she would marry someone else, possibly Lord Hemsworth. John writhed. He had set his heart on this woman. He had bent her strong will to love him as a proud woman only can. She had been hard to win, but she was his as much as if they were already married. His by right, 
as the living Galatia was by right of the sculptors, who gave her marble heart the throbbing life and love of his own. "'She is mine. I cannot give her up,' he said aloud. There was no voice, nor any that answered. Strange how the ploughshare turns up little tags and ends of forgotten rubbish buried by the mould of a few years' dust. One utterance of Archie is absolutely forgotten till now was continually recurring to John's mind. Its barbed point rankled. There must be a mint of money in an old barrack stuffed full of gimcracks like this. If ever I wanted a hundred or two, I would trot out one of those little silver johnnies in no time, if they were mine. And he would. If the thought of what Colonel Tempest and Archie would achieve after his own death had stung John as Archie said that, how could he bear to stand by and see them do it? The books, the pictures, the family manuscripts she was even then arranging, the jewels, the renowned diamond necklace that the Spanish government had offered to buy from his grandfather, which he had hoped one day to clasp on Di's neck. All the possessions of the past, but almost regal state of a great name, which he had kept with such a reverent hand. He should live to see them cast right and left, lost, sold, squandered, stolen. Archie would give the diamonds to the first actress who asked for them. Colonel Tempest would be equally open-handed. As the days went on, John shut his eyes to the pictures in the gallery as he passed through it. A mute suspense and reproach seemed to hang about the whole place. The Velasquez and the Titian peered at him. Tempest of the Red Hand clutched his sword-hilt uneasily. Maris's old Dutchwoman, seemed to have lost her interest in selling her marvellous string of onions to the little boy. Ribalta's Spanish Jesuit fingered the red cross of Santiago embroidered on his breast, and looked askance at John. John turned back many times from the library door. The new books which he had bound in exact reproduction of a beautiful old missile of the Tempest collection, and for the arrival of which he had been eagerly waiting, remained untouched in their packing-cases. He could not look at them. Once he went into the dining-hall, unused when he was alone, and opened one of the ponderous shutters. The rich light pierced the solemn gloom, catching the silver sconces on the wall, and the silver figures standing in the carved niches above the fireplace. "'You will not give us up,' they seemed to say, and the little cavalier turned to his lady with a shake of his head. As John closed the shutter, his eyes fell on the Tempest motto on the pane, Je le ferai durant ma vie, and it stabbed him like a knife. He went out into the open air like one pursued, and paced at the dead forest waiting for the spring. All he had held so sacred meant nothing then, nothing, nothing, nothing. The Tempest motto round which he had bound his life, round which his most solemn convictions and aspirations had grown up, had nothing to do with him. He had been mocked. He, a nameless bastard, the offspring of a mere common intrigue, had been fooled into believing that he was John Tempest, the head of one of the greatest families in England, that everybody belonged to him and he to it as entirely as, nay more than, his own hands and feet and eyes. It was as if he had been acting a serious part to the best of his ability on a stage with many others and suddenly they had all dropped their masks, and were grinning at him with satire faces in grotesque attitudes. And he found that he alone had mistaken a screaming farce, of which he was the butt, for a drama of which he imagined himself one of the principal figures. John laughed a harsh, wild laugh under the solemn, overarching trees. Everything, himself included, had undergone a hideous distortion. His whole life was dislocated. His faith in God and man wavered. The keystone of his existence was gone from the arch, and the stones struck him as they fell round him. The confusion was so great that for the first few days he was incapable of action, incapable of reflection, incapable of anything. Mitty. That thought came next. That stung. He had nothing in the wide world which he could call his own, no roof for Mitty, no fire to warm her by. He was absolutely without means. His mother's small fortune he had sunk in an annuity for Mr. Goodwin. What would become of Mitty? 
How would she survive being uprooted from her little nest in the garret gallery? How would she bear to see her lamb turned adrift upon the world? Mitty was growing old, and her faithful love for him would make the last years sorrowful which were so happy now. Oh, if he could only wait till Mitty died! John had not wept a tear for himself, but he hid his face against the trunk of one of the trees that were not his, and sobbed aloud at the thought of Mitty. And next day came a letter from Archie, saying that Colonel Tempest was at death's door in one of the London hospitals, owing to having accidentally shot himself with a revolver. John sent money much more than was actually necessary, and drew breath. Nothing could be done until Colonel Tempest was either convalescent or dead. He was reprieved from telling Mitty anything for the moment. And as the spring was just beginning to whisper to the sleeping earth, and the buds of the horse-chestnut to grow white and woolly beneath the nursery windows, as John had seen them many and many a time. How or why I know not, but with the waking of the year, Mitty began to fail. She had never been ill in John's recollection. She had had a bone in her leg occasionally, but accepting that mysterious ailment and a touch of rheumatism in later years, Mitty had always been quite well. She was not actually ill now, but... It was useless to tell her not to do her nurseries herself, and to positively forbid her to wash his socks and handkerchiefs. Mitty worked exactly the same, and John, with an ache at his heart, came indoors every day in time for nursery tea, and Mitty made him buttered toast, and was happy beyond words. But I think her eyesight must have begun to fail her, or she would have seen how grey and haggard the face of her lamb became as the days went by. Who shall say when a thought begins? Long before we see it, it was there, but our eyes were holden. L'amour commence par l'ombre. So do many things besides love. The letters were destroyed. When did John think of that first, or rather, when did he first hear it whispered? Why was his mind always going back to that? He would not have burned them if he had taken time to consider but the first impulse to do with them, as their writer had herself intended, had been acted upon before he had even thought of their bearing upon himself and others. At any rate, they were gone, quite gone, sprinkled to the four winds of heaven. There was no other proof. And his, no, not his father, Mr. Tempest, who knew all about him, had intended him to be his heir. He had left him his name and his place with a solemn charge to do his duty by them. I have done it, said John to himself, as those two would never have done. Shall I let all go to rack and ruin now? If I was not born a tempest, I have become one. I am one. And if I marry one, my children will be tempests, and those two fools will not be suffered to pull overly stone from stone and drag the great name into the dust, as they would, as they assuredly would. Had not Mr. Tempest foreseen this, when he exacted that solemn promise from John on his deathbed to uphold the honour of the family? Could he break that promise? And through the vain sophistries, upsetting them all, a mad cry rang. Di loves me! She loves me at last! I cannot give her up! The challenge was thrown out into the darkness. No one took it up. A fierce restlessness laid hold on John. He rushed up to London several times to hear how Colonel Tempest was going on. Each time he told himself that he was going to see Di. But although the first time he went to see Colonel Tempest's lodgings, the servant informed him that Di was with her father, he did not ask to see her. Each time he came back without having dared to go to the little house in Kensington. He could not meet those grave, clear eyes with the new gentleness in them that went to his head like wine. He knew they would make him forget everything, everything except that he loved her, and would sell his very soul for her. Time stopped. In all this enormous interval the buds of the horse-chestnut were not yet burst green. It was ages since he had seen the first primrose, and yet to-day, as he walked in the woods on the day after his return from another futile journey to London, they were all out in the forest still. 
and something stirred within him that had not deigned to take notice of all his feverish asseverations and wanderings, that had not rebuked him, that had not even listened when he had said repeatedly that he could not give up Di. By an invisible hand the challenge was taken up, and John knew the time of conflict was at hand. He walked on and on, not knowing where he went, past the forest and the meadowland, and away over the rolling moors, with only Lindo for his companion. At last, his newly returned strength failing him, he threw himself down in the dry, wind-swept heather. He had not outstripped his thoughts. This was the appointed place. He knew it even as he flung himself down. His hour was come. It was an April afternoon, pale and bleak. The late frost had come back and had silenced the birds. One only deeply in love, somewhere near at hand but invisible, repeated plaintively over and over again a small bird-name in the silence of the shrinking spring. And John's heart said over and over again one little word, Die, die, die. There are some sacrifices which partake of the nature of self-mutilation. That is why principle often falls before the inslaught of a deep human passion, which is nothing but the rebellion of human nature brought to bay, against the execution upon itself of that dread command of the spiritual nature. If thy right hand offend thee, cut it off. To give up certain affections is with some natures to give up all possibility of the quickening into life of that latent maturer self that craves for existence in each one of us. It is to take, for better or for worse, a more meagre form of life, destitute, not of happiness, perhaps, but of those common joys and sorrows which most of all bind us in sympathy with our fellow-men. What marriage in itself is to the majority, the love of one fellow-creature, and one only, is to the few. To a few, happily a very few, there is only one hand that can minister among the pressure of the crowd. There was none other woman in the world for John, save only Di. Sayings, common to vulgarity, profaned by every breach of promise case, can yet be true sometimes. Die, 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 said John. He tried to recall her face, but he could not. When they were together he had not seen her. He had only felt her presence only trembled at each slight movement of her hands. He always watched them when he was talking to her. He knew every movement of those strong, slender hands by heart. She had a little way of opening and shutting her left hand as she talked. He smiled even now he thought of it. And she had a certain wave in her hair just above the ear that was not the same over the other ear. But her face... No, he could not see her face. He tried again. They were sitting once again, he and she, not very near, nor very far apart, in the low entresol room at Overley. He could see her now. She was arranging the lilies of the valley, and he was saying to himself, as he watched her with his chin in his hands, This is only the beginning. There will be many times like this, only dearer and sweeter than this. Many times. That deep conviction approved as false as all the rest, as false as everything else which he had trusted. And all in a moment as he looked, as he remembered, was it endurance, was it principle, that seemed to snap? He set his teeth and ground his heel into the earth. Agony had come upon him. Passion, writhing in torment, rose gigantic without warning, and seized him in a tightened grip. It was a duel to the death. John sat motionless in the solitude of the heather, the bird was silent. On either hand the level moors met the level sky. Lindo walked in and out in semi and total eclipse near at hand, now merging life-size upon a hillock, now visible only as an erect travelling tail amid the tether. The sun came faintly out. There was a little speech of bees, a little quivering among the poised spears of the tall bleached grasses against the sky. Time passed. John's was not the easy faith which believes that in another world what has been given up in this will be restored a thousandfold. The hope of future reward had no more power to move him than the fear of future punishment. The heaven of rewards of which those speak who have authority 
would be no heaven at all to many, a place from which the noblest would turn away. Love, worthy of the name, even down here, gives all, asking nothing back. John did not try to define even to himself the faith by which he had lived so far, but as the veiled sun stooped near and nearer to the west, he began to see, as clearly as he saw the sword-grass shaking against the sky, that he was about to remain true to it, or be false to it, for ever. Perhaps that faith was more than anything else a stern allegiance to the giver of that law within the heart which independent natures ever recognize as the only true authority, which John had early elected to obey, which he had obeyed with ease till now. He had been condemned by many as a free thinker, for to be obedient to the divine prompting has ever been stigmatized as lawlessness by those who are obedient to a written code. John had no code. Yet God, who made, if the Tories who cheaply move in flocks on beaten highways could only believe it, those solitary, isolated natures, knew what he was about. And to those to whom little human guidance is vouchsafed, he adds courage, and that self-reliance which comes only of a deep-rooted faith in a God which will not keep silence, who will not leave the traveller journeying towards him unpiloted upon a lonely shore, or ultimately suffer his least holy one to see corruption. John looked wildly round him. Even nature seemed to have turned against him. It spoke of peace, when there was no peace. For nature has no power to mitigate the bitterness of that cup of self-surrender which even Christ himself, beneath the kindred stars of still Gethsemane, prayed might pass from him. John hid his convulsed face in his hands. The crises of life have their hour of loneliness and prostration, their agony and bloody sweat. That cup which may not pass, that cup which may not pass, how ennobling it is to read of in the lives of others, how interesting to theorize upon in our own. How appalling an actual experience, when it is in our hands to drink or to refuse, refusing forever with it, if we accept it not, the hand of him who offers it. The solemn world of grey earth and sky waited. The light in the west waited. How much longer were they to wait? How much longer would this bowed figure sway itself to and fro? "'I will do it,' said John suddenly and with a harsh, inarticulate cry he flung himself down on his face among the heather, clutching the soft earth, for the hand of God, whom he would not deny, was heavy on him. End of Volume 3, Chapter 7《ボリューム3、Chapter 8、of Diana Tempest、by Mary Chumley。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Recording by Simon Evers Volume 3, Chapter 8 The dead abide with us, though stark and cold, earth seems to grip them, they are with us still. They have forged our chains of being, for good or ill. Mathilde Blind John was late. Mitty looked out several times to see if he were coming, and then put down the tea-cake to the fire. At last his step came slowly along the garret gallery, and Lindo, who approved of nursery tea, walked in first, his dignity somewhat impaired by a bra hanging from his back flounce. John saw the firelight through the open door, and the figure in the low chair waiting for him. She had heard him coming, and was getting stiffly up to make the tea. "'Mitty, you should not wait for me,' he said, sitting down in his own place by the fire. Would they let her keep the brass kettle and her silver teapot? Yes, no doubt they would, but somebody would have to ask. He supposed he would be that somebody. Everything she possessed had been bought by himself with other people's money. He let the tea last as long as possible. If Lindo had more than his share of tea-cake, no one was the wiser. At last Mitty cleared away and sat down in the rocking-chair. Don't like the candles, Mitty? Why, Mop, my dear, I can't be sitting with me hands before me and holes in your socks, ashamed to be seen. John came and sat down on the floor beside her, and leaned his head against her. Never mind the socks just now. There is something I want to talk to you about. 
He looked at the fire through the bars of the high nursery fender, and something in its glimmer, seen from so near the floor, through the remembered pattern of the wires which he had lost sight of for twenty years, suddenly recalled the times when he had sat on the hearthrug, as he was sitting now, with his head against Mrs. Knee, confiding to her what he would do when he was a man. "'Do you remember, Mitty?' he said how I used to tell you that when I grew up you should ride in a carriage and have a gold brooch and a clock that played a tune. I remember, my darling, and how, next time Charles went into York, you give him all you had, and half a crown it was, to buy me a brooch, and the silly staring fool went and spent it, and brought back that great thing with the mock stones in, and you was as pleased as pleased. Ha! <laughs> I was angry with Charles for taking your bits of money, and all he said was, well, Mrs. Empson, I went to a many shops, and I give five shillings for it so as to get a big un. I remember it, said John. It was about the size of a small poultice. And so Charles paid half. Good old Charles. I seem to have been much deceived in my youth. His deep-set eyes watched the fire, watched the semblance of a little castle in the heart of the glow. Mitty was quite happy with her darling's head against her knee. When the castle falls in, I will tell her, said John to himself. But the fire had settled itself. The castle held. At last Mitty put out her hand and gave it a poke. Not with the brass poker, of course, but with a little black slave which did that polished aristocrat's work for it. Mitty, said John, I am not so rich now as when I was in pinafores, and even then, you see, the brooch was not bought with my own money. Charles gave half. I have never given you anything that was paid for with my own money. I have been spending other people's money all my life. "'Why, bless you, dear heart,' said Mitty, "'and who gave me my silver teapot, I should like to know, and the ivory work-box, and that very kettle staring you in the face, and the witchwood tea-things, and, and everything, if it was not you?' John did not answer. His face twitched. The bars of the fender were blurred. The brass kettle, instead of staring him in the face— melted quite away. Mitty stroked his head and face. "'Crying,' she said. "'My lammy crying.' "'Not for myself, Mitty. "'Who for, then? "'For that Miss Dinah?' "'No, Mitty, for you. "'This is no home for you and me.' He took her hard hand and rubbed his cheek against it. "'It belongs to Colonel Tempest. "'I am not my father's son, Mitty.' "'Well, my precious,' said Mitty, soothingly, in no wise discomposed by what John feared would have quite overwhelmed her. "'And if your poor mammy did say as much to me when she was light-headed, when her pains was on her, there's no call to fret about that, seeing it's a long time ago, and her dead and all. Poor thing, I can see her now with her pretty eyes and her little hands, and she put her head against me and say, "Nursey, nursey, I was to her, I'm not fit neither to live nor to die.' Many, many's the night I've roared to think of her after she was gone, when you was asleep in your crib. But there's no need for you to fret, me dearie. John's heart contracted. Mitty knew also. Oh, you might have but have started life knowing what even Mitty knew. They'd no business to marry her to Mr. Tempest, continued Mitty, shaking her head. And she, poor thing, idolising that black Lord Fane as was her first cousin, it wasn't likely after that she settled to Mr. Tempest, who was as light as tow. It was against nature. She never took a bit of interest in him, nor him in her neither, that I can see. A hard man he was, too. A hard man. She sent for him when she was dying. She would not see him while there was any chance. Forgive me, she says. She says it over and over, me holding her up. I wouldn't ask if it I was staying, but I'm doing the best I can by dying. It's not much to make up, but it's the best I can. And she says, don't think Jack as all women are bad like me. There's a many good ones as'll make you happy yet when I'm gone. I can see him now, standing by her, looking past her out of the window with his face like a flint. I've known two false ones, he says, and he went away without another word. And she says after a bit to me, I've always been frightened at the very thought of dying, but it's living I'm frightened of now. Oh, Master John, your poor mammy. She did repent, and Mr. Tempest sent for me to the library after the funeral, and he says, Promise me, nurse, that you'll never repeat what your mistress said to me when she was not herself. He looked hard at me, and I promised. And I've never breathed it to any living soul, not to one I haven't, 
from that day to this. I found it out three weeks ago, said John. But as I am not Mr. Tempest's son, everything I have belongs by right to Colonel Tempest, the next heir, not to me. Overly is not mine. It never was mine. But Mitty could not be made to understand what his mother's frailty had to do with John. When at last she grasped the idea that John would make known the fact that he was not his father's son, she was simply incredulous that her lamb could do such a thing, could bring shame upon his own mother. No, whatever else he might do, he would never do that. Why, Mrs. Alcock would know, and friends as she was with Mrs. Alcock, and had been for years, such a word had never passed her lips. And the people in the village, and the tradespeople, and Jones and Evans from York, who were putting up the new curtains, everybody would know. Mitty became quite agitated. Surely, surely he'd never tell against his poor mother in her grave. Mitty, said John, forcing himself to repeat what it had been difficult enough to say once, don't you see that I can't stay here and keep what is not mine? Nothing is mine if I am not Mr. Tempest's son. I ought never to have been called so. We must go away. But Mitty was perplexed. Not in that great weary house in London, she said anxiously with every spot of water to carry up from the bottom. "'That is not mine either,' said John, in despair, rising to his feet and standing before her. "'Oh, Mitty, try and understand. Nothing is mine. Nothing, 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 not even the clothes I have on. I am a beggar.' Mitty looked at him in a dazed way. She could not understand, but she could believe. Her chin began to tremble. It was almost a relief to see at last the tears which he had dreaded from the first. "'My lamb a beggar!' she said over and over again. And she cried a little, but not much. Mitty was getting old, and she was not able to realise a change, a change so incomprehensible as this. "'But we need not be unhappy,' said John, kneeling down by her and putting his arms round her. "'We shall be together still. Wherever I go, you will go with me.' I don't yet know where it will be, but we shall have a little home together somewhere, just you and I, and you'll do my socks and handkerchiefs, won't you, Mitty? And John controlled his voice, but he hid his face in her lap that she might not see it. We'll be so happy together. At the moment I think John would have given up heaven itself to make that hour smooth to Mitty. And your cakes, Mitty, he went on hoarsely, they are better than anyone else's. You shall have a little kitchen, and you will make the cakes yourself, won't you, and the—' His voice tumbled heavily. The, the, the rock buns. "'My precious,' said Mitty, sobbing, "'don't you fret yourself. I can make a many things besides them. Albert puddings and moulds and them little cheese straws and, and a sight of things. There's a deal of work in my old hands yet. It's only the spring as has took the starch out of me. I always feel a sinking in the spring.' Lord, my darling, the times and times again I've been sitting here just dithering with a moss and crochet, or idling of a bit of reading, and wishing he was having a set of night-shirts to me. Love had found out the way. John had appealed to the right instinct. Mitty was already busying herself with a future in which she should minister to her child's comfort, and John saw, with a relief that was half a pang, that the calamity of his life held hardly any place in the heart that loved him so much. "'I've a sight of things,' continued Mitty, wiping her eyes. "'Books and pictures and cushions put away. "'My precious shall not go short. "'And there's two pair of linen sheets that I bought with my own money, "'and pillow slips to match, and six silver teaspoons and one dessert. "'My lamb shall have things comfortable about him.' "'She fell to communing with herself. "'John did not speak. "'I'll leave me places tidy,' said Mitty. "'Tidy I didn't find em, but tidy I'll leave em. I can't go till after the spring cleaning, Master John. I never trust that Fanny to do the scrubbing unless I'm behind her. I caught her washing round the mats instead of under only last week. John felt unable to enter into the question of the spring cleaning. There was another silence. At last Mitty said defiantly, And I shall take your Morocco shoes and in your little chair as I give you myself. I don't care what anybody says, I shall take em. And the old horse and the Navy's Ark. "'It will be all right,' said John, getting slowly to his feet. "'No people will want to have them, or anything of mine.' And he kissed her, and went out. 
He went to the library and sat down by the fire. The resolution and aspiration of a few hours ago, where were they now? He felt broken in body and soul. Linda came in, nibbled John's elbow, and scrutinised the fire. John scratched him absently on the top of his back between the tufts. Linda, he said, the world is a hard place to live in. But Linda, bulging with an unusual allowance of tea cake and winnowing the air with an appreciative hind leg, did not think so. End of Volume 3, Chapter 8